Have a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing. One of the central principles of my life is that no one knows enough to be a pessimist about anything. And that each and every one of us, when we close our mind to what is possible for us or what is possible for humanity, closes off the genius that resides and lives in each and every one of us. Having an open mind doesn't necessarily mean uh, finding fault with all of the things that you've been taught by others. It means opening yourself up to the potentiality and the possibility that anything and everything is possible. So having a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing really means finding within ourselves the ability to get rid of a trait that I find so common in contemporary, in the contemporary world. Do you know that most people that I meet spend their lives looking for occasions to be offended? They actually are out there hoping that they can find some reason to be offended. And there's no shortage of reasons. They're out there everywhere. The way this person dressed, the what the worst person said, they turn on the TV, they hear the news, they're offended by this. Someone didn't, uh, someone used language that they didn't like. Someone doesn't share the same customs that you. And people all day long, in fact, if you keep track tomorrow, you will find uh, probably a hundred reasons that you can go around being offended. But a mind that is open to everything and attached to nothing is a mind that says, I'm never looking for anything to be offended by. And that whatever anybody else out there has to say, my response to that is, that's an interesting point of view. I've never considered that before. Very capable are they? They don't have very high aspirations. That's, if there's anything that I think people suffer from in this country, it's that not that they fail to achieve so much as that they fail to aspire. They don't have a sense of their own internal capacities and greatness or abilities to handle just about any situation. Well, we've talked about that before, but how can a book tell you how to do this? Well, a book can't do it for you. I'm the yeah, first one I'm to admit that. that. Absolutely. Right. Just like going to a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist cannot make your life any better. I'm convinced of that. Nor can a Valium or anything like that. It has to be something that you do internally yourself. It can provide your guidelines. It's very much like if you, your car breaks down and you got your repair manual there. You can say, well, why isn't this manual fixing my car? <laughs> <laughs> Manuals don't fix cars. They can just give you the information. You either do it to yourself or you don't. But can you the know? book give you a way to rate yourself as far as what, how, how victimized you, you really are? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, a lot of people are very critical of uh, books and self-help books and whether or not they can really be helpful to people and so on. And I know in my own life I've been really influenced by some very significant writing of people who've lived before me. Uh, a lot of poets, uh, a lot of the great, you know, even Mark Twain, reading people. Books have really influenced my life. These kinds of books influence people's lives today. I know it from the mail that I get. And, uh, well, what's step one step after one, you've read the book? Step one is to change your expectations around. Like every situation you go into, all right, you got who victimizes people the most in our culture? family members, you know, uh, your parents telling you that you ought to be the way they want you to be, your, uh, your children <coughs> telling you that they expect you to make their lunches for them, they expect you to pick after the, up after them and so on. Uh, bureaucrats, our government, uh, clerks, people like that, waiters, tipping when you're getting bad service, all of these kinds of yeah. things. You just change around your expectations. You say, I am not going to allow this person or this institution to get me. I'm not going to try to change it for the whole world. But Wayne, how to specifically, I feel sorry for mothers who are victimized every day, I mean mm. by husbands and by yeah. kids, you know. Yeah. They, have no, they have no self left. They give everything. But, and they but they've taught themselves that. They've, they've said to their husbands or their children, uh, it's okay, you can push me around. If you want to get uh, angry at me or upset at me, then I'll take that. And I believe you get treated in life the way you teach people to treat you. If you've taught people that you're going to be a dish rag or you're going to be somebody who's going to clean up all the time and you're not going to have any esteem for yourself, then 
naturally people are going to come along and, and just do that. But it's you. a desire to be approved, to be loved. So now you're saying no more Mr. Nice Guy. I don't think people are loved. I think it's a myth uh, that you that you love dish rags or that you love people. I, I think people respect strength, not weakness. And you stand up to somebody, you say what's really on your mind, and at first people will feign it. They'll, you know, they'll fake it. They'll say, oh my God, you've really hurt my feelings. That's a strategy. That's a technique to get you. You know, if I can get you to come over and visit me on Sunday by using guilt, you know, and saying, oh, if you don't visit me, you know, it's okay. I went through 18 hours of child labor, but that's okay. And if you don't come, then, you know, and I can use all of this stuff. And you'll come. Well, I'm going to continue to use that. But if you say, wait a second, you know, I've got a right to decide where I'm going to be on Sunday. And I'm, I can't be there this Sunday. And you're firm about that. You know, what happens is after a while, people respect you more. What happens at work, though, when you go down and tell that to your boss? The very same thing I'm talking about. It, uh, you're fired. I, I'm the, no, no <laughs> hardly ever. And even if you are, it's generally for the better. Uh, p even on the job, people respect strength. You don't want somebody on the job who's always going to be a yes man, who's always going to do... You know, if you're trying to run the show and you want to know how things are going and what the reactions are, and you got a lot of yes men around you, which is like what Nixon had around him. All, everybody just going around saying yes sir, yes. And you find that the show's ratings are going down and down and down because people aren't being willing to be honest with you. You want to have a producer or director or, or staff people who are going to say, look, this is what you're doing that's not working, this is what's effective. You don't have to be nasty or Yeah, but boorish. we expect that. But the question I have is, if you've set a pattern in your household as a mother or mm. even in a relationship with a man or right. vice versa, and you've, you've been the giver and the mm. nice guy, all of a sudden when you make that change, then don't people pull back and say, wait, you don't love me anymore. Yeah, they do, and that's a technique too. That's a strategy to get you to go back to uh, being a slave again. And when they, when you suddenly say to them, "I love you," it has nothing to do with love. It has to do with my interest in being my own person. And you're, you're using guilt, saying, you know, you don't love me, isn't, isn't going to work anymore. How many women? How many times in your life have you gone out with a man when you were dating, or if you're dating now, uh, has somebody called you up and you know you don't want to go out with this person? You know, you're nice guy, everything is, but you know there's nothing there. And you and, can't say no. Yeah, and you just say, oh, well, and then there, there you are, three weeks later, you're going out on a date and you're, and this guy is coming on to you and all, and you just say, what am I doing here? I know. And learning how to just say no, <laughs> you know, I don't want to go. And he says, well, you know, you're hurting my feelings, and I'll probably have to put my head in the oven, and you know, any number. Of <laughs> you say, all right, all right, I'll go, I'll go. You know, anything. You know, and this is the, you know, that's a victim status. You've got to learn not to make commitments for things. Uh, and Actually, what you're saying, be a little selfish, huh? Selfish, not inconsiderate, yes, but selfish, definitely, in the of sense your own of, time. Yeah, it's your life, it's your yeah. time, it's the only shot you get at this life, and why should anybody else run it for you? That's, well, it that's seems really like there's an awful saying. lot of selfish people in the world already. Well, yeah. selfish, when you use selfish, generally you mean inconsiderate, you know, stepping yeah. on other people, not caring about others. I don't believe in that. I don't do that myself. I spend most of my life in the service of other people. But it's because if you love yourself, you can you can give love away. If you if you can't give away what you don't have, if you don't feel okay, good about it. Okay, that's you, step one. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Mm -hmm. Number two, it's like going out and practicing. You know, uh, really standing up for the things. You know, somebody's out there. Uh, you mean go practice being insulted? <laughs> <laughs> if it's necessary, but but it isn't necessary. It's you know, I have a thing called. Being quietly effective, John. And it's like, you know, a lot of people misconstrue their goals in life. They pull into a gas station, all right, and they want their windshield washed. The guy is too busy, he doesn't care, he's not interested, he doesn't wash your windshield. This person who wants his windshield washed forgets his goal. It's just to have a windshield washed, that's all. He now says, I'm gonna reform that guy, how dare he treat me that way? Who does he think? And he's gonna and this guy's behavior is suddenly controlling them emotionally and your goal is just to simply say look would you mind washing my windshield you don't have to give a lecture if the guy says look i'm too busy you say well now i'm going to talk to the manager or whatever you know you go on to the next step or you get out and wash it yourself if yeah. necessary but you don't allow other people's behavior to be the controlling thing of your emotions in your life whether that's that clerk there or whether it's your husband or your children well you or said whatever. you said something about explanation what about people that feel like they've got to give a long drawn out explanation with a thousand they, reasons yeah, and excuses for they become victims you know and then somebody at the end you know what they'll say i just don't understand you yeah. I don't, oh my god he doesn't understand <laughs> me i better stay not i better go back and i better start <laughs> washing his underwear confident or versus cocky i mean Confident versus insulting. I yeah. mean, is there the, a fine line? Do you have to learn, relearn the, the, that? The, the very specific line. Confident means standing up for what you believe. Cocky or abusive or conceited means trying to convince other people of how terrific you are. If you run your life on your inner signals, you don't have any need to show anybody else how great you are. If you're confident, you just simply do it. The thing that Neville taught me, and a lot of this is from the teachings of Neville, mm -hmm. uh, Neville Goddard, who died in the 1970s, he's, he, he basically said that um, all of us have within us this 
amazing capacity to manifest and attract anything that we want into our life. So how we call it, what, what words that we use, we have to be able to say, um, you know, in the secret they say, you, you get what you want, you know, and what is missing. And what Neville said and what, what has come to me and what I got from the I Am Discourses and what I get from the New Testament, which I read before I did this, is that you, you say, I will attract into my life what I am, not what I want. And I am capable of attracting all things that, that, that the source is, is capable of attracting. So that's the difference. It's like you get what you are rather than what you want. So you want to become you can't go around and ask these divine beings, you know, angels, whatever you want to call them. Who are to, right here all the time. Always. You right can't, here, you can't right ask here. them to help me out. You have to, you have to become like they are. That when, you're, when you become angelic, when you become a divine being yourself, when you are giving, when you are serving, when you are in that place, they will come to you. That's what happened to you in India. Mm -hmm. You then begin to see yourself in everything. That's what the Tao Te Ching teaches as well. Yes. They call it your original nature. Your original nature is reverence for all of life, gentleness, kindness, and service towards others. That's Lao Tzu 500 years before the birth of Christ, saying that's our original nature. Yes. Reverence for all of life, gentleness, kindness, service towards others, giving, offering, serving. And when you get to that place where you no longer have any judgment within you towards any of God's children, that means no condemnation, no criticism, no judgment towards anyone. My friend Byron Katie says that uh, to believe that you need what you don't have is the definition of insanity. To believe that you need what you don't have because you're already here, so you've already proven that you don't need it. So to go around believing that I can't be happy, fulfilled, you know, whatever it is, unless I get the stuff that I don't already have, it's a complete and total illusion. It's a, it's a thought that isn't even true. Just, there's no truth to it whatsoever. You don't need anything. And when you get that, the irony is you're no longer, you're no longer attached. Your, your total life is about, it's just about living those virtues. How can I serve? How can I be sincere? How can I be gentle? How can I be supportive? And thinking like that. And that's how I think now. And because of that, I'm, I'm in meaning. And being in meaning, the times that I was in ambition, you know, is, uh, is delivering more and more and more and more of what I wanted so much then. And now that I'm not attached to it, it's like I can just be like the, I can be like the cat, you know, I can just go about my business and just let it follow after me. So what I say to people who really want to uh, access the, uh, the, the transition, from, you know, from ambition to meaning, if they really want to access it, is to get your thoughts off of yourself. I do it on the radio every, every Monday when it's like all, all my questions, you know, all the questions are about why can't I manifest this, why can't I have that, this isn't working and so on. And my response back to them all the time over and over again is uh, take what it is that you would really like to attract into your life, whatever it is, whether it's wealth, a job, you know, money, a nice watch, a new car, whatever it is, and want it more for somebody else than you want it for yourself. Just, just want it more. Just think about that and, and, and think about how much joy it would give you to be able to <clears throat> put your attention on that. And just keep your thoughts on that. You know, take your thoughts off of yourself and start living the four virtues. Start being sincere, start being supportive, you know, start having this reverence, reverence for, for, for their life and so on. And just shift off of what's in it for me, you know, and, and how much am I going to get and uh, why isn't it here fast enough and how much, how, why is there shinier than mine and, you know, and so on. Off of that. And, and, and begin to project that and do that in this world. I don't care whether you're a school teacher, it does, I don't care if you're a dental hygienist or if you're a carpenter or you know, whatever it is out there that you are doing. If you can take your attention, your, if you want the door to open, if you want the door to open to meaning, then the only way that door is going to open is if you understand that you have to leave your attachment to this grossly world of the material things and what's in it for me and how much am I getting and shift your energy, your thoughts onto how may I offer, how may I serve.